on uh, an incredible guest today, Brian Clayton. Uh, let's bring him on. So what's up, Brian? How you doing? Hey, what's up, man? Good to be here. Good to be here too with you. I I'm excited to do this. I mean, I, I was looking up stuff about you before this, and one thing that jumped out to me was uh, this idea of being an adventure. And, I, and I, a lot of people say, I'm a serial entrepreneur, but you're that, but you're also a serial adventurer. So tell us a little bit more about how you've been able to create that kind of lifestyle. Yeah, so I came to learn this about two years ago that for me, travel is, is a part of passion of life for me. Like I, it's, it's just part of why I do what I do now. And it wasn't always that way. Uh, about two years ago, uh, my co-founder in Green Pal said, you know what, we've had a great year. Let's just go on like a one month or two month trip somewhere. We can still work. We can still do everything we need to do, uh, but let's just go see Australia and let's just go see what's going on down there. And so I said, you know what? I, I had never been out of the country. <laughs> I said, I said, this is crazy. Uh, but you know what we did? We, we doubled that year and we, we've doubled every year since then. But like the, the idea of just going on this adventure appealed to me. And so we did. We went down to Australia and New Zealand and and just had a had a blast. We were still working every day. We were still getting things done, but it was just awesome being in a different culture, different environment. And, uh, ever since then, I've just been hooked on, on the lifestyle of, of traveling. I, I now travel probably half the year. Um, and I'm always going somewhere and I'm always trying to experience new cultures and new, new places that I've never seen. And so now being at the helm of a digital business kind of enables me to do that, enables me to, to go. I just actually got back from Mexico. Uh, I was there for five weeks and, wow. you know, I was still working every day, yeah. but, uh, but I, I, st I was able, I'm able to see things and enjoy different experiences and different cultures because I'm not chained to a desk. Um, and my life hasn't always been that way. The first 15 years of, of, of business, I, I built a traditional landscaping business, uh, from scratch, uh, just from, from myself and a push mower to over 150 employees. Wow. And that was the type of company that if I went away for longer than a week, I would come back and it wouldn't be there. Like I had to be there every single day wrangling that business. Uh, but now Green Pal is a much different type of business. It's a digital business. It's a digital platform. And I can run it from anywhere. And so uh, to your point, uh, now becoming like an adventurer to, to you know, I'm using air quotes here. And just seeing as much of the world as I can and spending as much time out there as I can is just a part of my passion for life and why I do what I do. Oh, I love that. Um, I want to dig into that. But before I want to I want to pull out nuggets from the time be between you having 150 employees, you know, having that business in place where you guys were, you know, cutting grass essentially almost everywhere. It sounds like I mean, that's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of, uh, uh, that's a big company, 150 people, um, into getting into the digital space. Like what, what was that catalyst that caused you to be like, I, we got to build a digital platform. We got to make these adjustments. And then, um, what kind of shifts did you see have like needed to happen in order for you yeah. to, um, begin to step out of the business more and to feel like, Hey, I can start traveling and I can do more of these, these things beyond the business. Yeah, man, that's that's a great question, and, I, and I'll try to answer it from the highest level as I can. So 15-year period of time building the first company from zero to 150 people, over $10 million a year in revenue, um, running that business was like organized chaos every day. It was very asset intense, very people heavy. Uh, every day there was 100 problems, um, and I almost to a degree enjoyed it. Uh, because it was just fun, like solving problems on an hourly basis because, and every day was different. Um, but I had taken that company as far as I could. I, I, this was one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee. Uh, for me, the next step was going to be to like franchise it or, or, or build a, a new branch in another mar major market. And I just didn't have the appetite personally to do that. I felt like I had taken the business as far as I could. And so I, I decided, okay, it's time to start exploring an exit for this company. And from the time I had that notion in my head from, to the time I actually sold the business was two years. Mm. It took two years to get that business sold. But one of the largest landscaping businesses in the United States ended up buying it and kind of putting it into their umbrella, putting it into their organization. And then after that, I kind of, I, I, had, I took some time off and I came to realize something very important about myself was that 
for me, my business is the forcing function for me to level up in life. It is the thing that causes me to constantly be getting smarter, constantly uh, beginning to like growing new skills. It's the thing that that uh, quite honestly offers me humility um, because growing a business from scratch is one of the most humbling things you can do. Uh, it just makes me a better person. And so I decided, okay, it's time to start the next thing. What should I do? And that was really kind of obvious to me. I saw what Uber and Lyft and Airbnb were doing for analog style traditional transactions uh, with ride sharing and accommodations. I thought, okay, this this platform needs to exist. There needs to be an easier way for homeowners that just need to get a, a basic lawn mowing service to hire a good local lawn care guy or girl. And I thought, okay, let's just I'm going to re- I'm going to recruit two co-founders. Let's go to work. Let's start building this thing. As it turned out, uh, if I had known how hard it was going to be, I'd have never done it. Uh, so, so <laughs> luckily, sure we all me, would think that with whatever <laughs> yeah. we're building. Yeah. Luckily for me, I was naive, and my two co-founders were naive as well. We we uh, we spent like a hundred fifty, hundred eighty thousand dollars paying a local development shop in Nashville to build the first version of Green Pal, and we genuinely believed. We thought that we were going to launch this thing and then we were going to like market it and then we would just be off to the races. And that's not how it turned out. Uh, we launched in the summer of launched in the summer of 2013 and, uh, it was crickets. Uh, we, we couldn't get anybody to try to use it. We, we, we had to resort to passing out door hangers all over middle Tennessee just to beg people to try to use the thing. I think in all we, we passed out at least a hundred thousand, uh, door hangers all over Nashville. And even to this day, I could hang one of these door hangers with my eyes closed. I just know, like, I have the muscle memory. I've done so many <laughs> of these damn things. And so, and so uh, we luckily, we were able to get enough people to try to use the platform to get some early feedback to understand that, okay, we actually are solving a problem. We are uh, fulfilling a need in, in the marketplace. Let's keep doing this. And we had to retool as entrepreneurs, as business owners, teaching ourselves the actual skills that we were going to need to design, build, and distribute software. I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. I had spent the last 15 years uh, building a landscaping business. I mean, if you need me to change a transmission in a truck, I could do that. Like, if you need me to go run a lawnmower, I could do that. Uh, I know how to run teams that are doing physical labor, but I don't know the first thing about writing code. I don't know the first thing about, about designing software. And I sure as hell don't know the first thing about digital marketing. And so... It took myself and my two co-founders like two or three years to like learn this stuff. And so we just got in the trenches and started. One of my co-founders went to software school. Uh, My other co-founder and I studied product and distribution and marketing and PR and all of these like tangible skills that we needed to acquire to like breathe life into this thing. And we just didn't give up. We just kept hacking on it, kept working on it. And I'm talking about six, seven days a week sometimes 100-hour weeks, um, just grinding out those early days to go from zero to one to to manufacture that momentum was just excruciatingly difficult. But now here we are in in year seven. We're doing good. We've we've got some momentum going. We're we're, we're nationwide now. Uh, We have hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, We're going to do $20 million in revenue this year. So things are going well now. But for the first three, four, five years, it was very much an exercise of faith. Yeah. Well, and and that's, I mean, I think that's a perfect example of the entrepreneur growth um, aspect, right? Like, I'm sure there are days you wanted to quit, (laughs) you know, like, I I, I can completely resonate with this story around, like, I I have experience in the past coding. That was part of my major in college. You Mm. know, I grew up like you mowing lawns. And so, you know, I know the manual labor side of it. But I'm also in the mode I'm in now, you know, where I, I also own an online business. I tell my wife all the time, I was like, I, I spent a good 10 plus years of my life um, doing so much manual labor and maintenance. And I appreciate that hard work I put in. But I was like, for the rest of my life, I don't need to go buy a lawnmower. You know, I don't need to right. uh, invest in those those personal assets when, you know, the cost of labor is not super high. Uh, let alone, you know, like oftentimes, um, you know, at least I'm sure when you, when I were hired, when we were young and, and, and Des Moines Lawn's doing this service, it was like um, asking a local neighbor friend, uh, right. a kid, right, to to go do it. And, 
you know, versus, you know, go hopping on an app, going online and, and booking someone. Right, um, right. And the transaction happens all digitally. And it's just a matter like it's clockwork that you're able to get that kind of um, thing taken care of and you don't have to think about it. Um, exactly. And especially like, you know, it's interesting, not only uh, not only do uh, do you fit so well within this uh, this online entrepreneur space, obviously with what you've built, which is incredible, but also many of us are the ideal client or at least user, right, of wanting to get this service because we don't want to be the ones necessarily mowing our lawns you know, or doing that kind of work because we want to either reinvest our time with more right. growth opportunities in our business or just, you know, family or personal time like you've done with, uh, with traveling. So exactly. At the end of the day, we're selling time. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, uh, to your point, uh, when we first launched the platform, we had a, we, we had a, uh, we thought that our ideal homeowner that was going to use it was on the higher end, was upper class, was, you know, a uh, million dollar plus homes. Uh, the types of people that, that had the disposable income to hire a lawn mowing service. And so when we started passing out flyers, we were hitting these higher end neighborhoods up. What we had to learn the hard way was that that was not our target user. Our target user is uh, working class people, people that are working 70, 80 hours a week uh, just to make ends meet. that don't have time to mow their own yard. And so giving them the access and making it more cost effective for them to hire a lawn mowing service to come every week or every two weeks for 30 bucks, that was the itch that we were scratching. That was the problem that we were solving. And even to this day, more than half of our users are, are, more, are, are, on, the, are on the working class side of, of folks, the people that, that don't necessarily have like, you know, a, a million dollar house, but they have a house with a yard and they realize that they would rather pay somebody thirty dollars to go cut the grass than do it themselves, and also understand that by the time you buy a lawnmower, maintain it, you know, store it, uh, take three hours to mow your own yard, you're actually making less than minimum wage. And so we free them up to do whatever it is they want to do, or whatever is a higher and better use of their time. That is the the value proposition for GreenPal, and we didn't know that when we first got started. And so, like, that's an important lesson for anybody getting started in any business is. You start off with a set of assumptions, but you have to validate those and you have to test those and you have to like prove yourself wrong. And it, and if we hadn't gone through the effort of passing out 100,000 door hangers in middle Tennessee, we'd have never known that. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 sadly, we had to go through that pain to learn that, no, this is not our user. This is actually our user. It's on this side of town. It's not on this side of town. And so we don't pass out door hangers anymore, but that's something we had to do in the early days to, to get the momentum going and to start learning, not necessarily, not only getting a few hundred people to use the platform, but learning about who they are. What problem is it, is it that they're looking to solve? What uh, problems did we think they had, but they actually don't? There was another key lesson that we learned in those early days was we thought we, our value proposition was to be the cheapest grass cutting service that you can hire. Uh, because in my, in my, tenure in the landscaping business, you look at it from a contractor side, you're thinking, oh man, it's just all about price. Everybody just wants the cheapest service they can get. What we actually learned was after talking to the first 100, 200 people that used the platform was that they just wanted somebody to come out fast and reliably. They didn't necessarily want the cheapest. When, they, when they're looking for a lawn mowing service, it's because the grass is four feet tall. They just want somebody to come today or at latest tomorrow morning, mow the grass, get it under control and do it and actually show up. That's the problem that we were solving. And still to this day, reliability and speed are, are a bigger thrust for our value proposition than, than price necessarily is. Yeah. Well, and I would say most businesses, it, it would be the case, right? Because value versus price is so subjective where exactly. people are going to value the convenience. I mean, I, I look at that. You know, I think I think Green Pal has been compared to like the Uber for home service professional you know, homeowners and home home service professionals, and and Uber is kind of that same experience where you want to pay for the convenience of not having certain assets or having certain worries, um, and uh, and so to for you, what was the um, what was the moment they're like, okay, this is starting to catch on, we're seeing this momentum, like what kind of uh, shift? Um, and, and even like thought process, I think you hinted at it, right. With the mindset change around like, oh, we're not solving this problem. We're solving this problem. 
but yeah. what, what would you say? Like, what was that? Uh, when did momentum start to have happen? You know, so you, there's these little glimmers of hope as you as you start one of these things from scratch. You know, my my first business, traditional landscaping company, there was a a proven, uh, I guess playbook that I could follow. You know, I could look at bigger companies, see what they were doing. In fact, I even traveled to other major markets. Uh, one thing I would do is I would, I would go to trade shows and I would look at the biggest landscaping company in that town and I would look at their systems and processes. Then I would take them back to Nashville and I would put them in my business. So I was able to look at other big companies, look at what they were doing, improve on those things. And so that was how I grew that first business. Now the second business, Green Pal, it's, we're at like, and I don't like, we're at the outer edge of like what anybody's tried before in terms of like push a button, get the yard mode. There is no like analog for this. There is nobody's ever tried this before. There is no, there is no playbook. We're, we're literally inventing it as we go. And so a lot of that is trial and error and you're in the darkness and you're, and you're trying to figure out, is this thing going to work or not? And so there's, there was key moments over the last seven years, uh, where, where, you know, you're, you're reinforced to keep going forward. One was like, I think in year two, uh, maybe year three, it was a Saturday and, and, and we were all working and I think like 30 people signed up for it that day. And, and I didn't know who these 30 people were. So, which is big, uh, right? It's like, yeah, it's huge. no, no it's longer huge. like Joe and Jane down the street or, you know, my friends over here. Yeah. That's powerful. It's, it's huge. It was a Saturday, 30 some odd people had signed up that day. It was the biggest day we had ever had. And I, I couldn't tell you why, it was that uh, we had 30 some odd people. Now we have thousands a day, but, but, but then it was 30 people and, uh, and I didn't know any of their names. So that was a key moment for me that like, Oh, okay. Yeah. This could become a self-serve platform, uh, that we can market and distribute. And I mean, it was that going to write any paychecks? No, but it was still a moment. Um, and then, and then, you know, fast forward another two or three years, you know, and we, we did five million one year, and then ten million the next. Uh, that was another moment where it was like, okay, yeah, we can build an actual business. Because, because when you're starting one of these tech startups from scratch, you're like trying to just like build something that works, something that solves a problem for people that want to use it, and then you have to shift to, can I build an actual like profitable concern around this thing? And so it was at that moment that I realized, yeah, we can build an actual profitable business just doing this one thing, making like lawn mowing as easy as possible and like building the push a button, get the grass cut service. So those two moments stand out in the last six, seven years as key moments that reinforced me and my team to keep pushing forward. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's so powerful too, you know, for those listening who are on the journey, like all of us, right? We're at just different levels with facing similar, maybe pain points, right? Um, Recognizing that a great deal of patience and perseverance is required uh, to hit different, you know, levels of momentum. Uh, and so I, I love hearing this too, because not only uh, you didn't anticipate the amount of struggle, especially early on with building this, uh, but you already had successfully built and sold a previous business, right? So it's like, you know, you're, you're starting this whole new business and even if, you've built and sold before and had that success, you know, you still have to go through uh, the growing pains in that process again. Absolutely. And so so humbling. And it really did make me a better person because here I went from having, you know, a a successful uh, contracting business, $10 million a year in revenue, sold it the biggest, it was the biggest acquisition in the industry, I think for 10 years. Um, And, and so like, Starting over again and going from uh, running a business with hundreds of employees, being the man uh, of, of, my, of my little circle, to, hey, will you please try to use this thing to, so we can cut your grass for $30, please? Like Going through that was so humbling, and it just made me a better person. So like for me, my businesses are always an extension, like scaffolding around me as a person to help me grow and level up and, and, just, and just become just more humble, smarter, uh, just a better leader. It just helps me in so many ways. And so for me, like the second business, uh, 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 I literally like burned the boats starting it. Like I knew that I was going to see this thing to the end and, and that I, I was just going to like take it as far as I could. And so no matter how difficult it got 
and how hard the slog was, this was it. I didn't have a better idea and I wasn't going to give up. And so like it made that daily conversation in my head uh, just really a lot easier and a lot clearer. It's like, okay, you, you, you are going to be working on something. You're going to be growing something. You don't have any other better ideas. This is what you're working on. And, and, that, and luckily, my two co-founders and I stuck with it because there were many years that it was very much an exercise of faith. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and what, so with where you've built it now, uh, what's your vision moving forward? Um, where do you see this going uh, with the platform you have? Yeah, so we're just at a point now where we have good momentum behind us. We have what, uh, what Jim Collins uh, calls the flywheel effect. So it's like Jim Collins, good to great. He talks about the flywheel effect, and every great business has a little flywheel humming on the inside of it that makes it prosper and makes it grow. Uh, like Uber, for example. Uber, like the, the, more ri- the more drivers they have, the lower the fares, the lower the fares, the more riders, the more riders, uh, the more drivers, the more drivers, the decreased wait times, the decreased wait times, more, more, dri- more riders. And so it's like, it's just, it's just, it's this flywheel, this reinforcing flywheel that causes it to grow and causes it to prosper. We just started tapping into that to understand that, okay, the more homeowners that sign up to use the platform, uh, the, the quicker that the, the more vendors that want to use it, the more vendors that want to use it, the quicker their bids, the quicker their bids, the more people that hire, the more people that hire, uh, the more vendors that want to use it, more vendors that want to use it, the, the, the price goes down a little bit. And so like re, like creating this flywheel is, is something that's taken us seven years to do. And so that's where we're at now. We're just now where we have an engine at the core of this thing and we have some defensibility and a, like a little shallow moat around the platform that enables us to now look at, okay, where are we going next? And for us, like, we still have so much further to go in the United States in terms of going deep and in every nook and cranny in the country. And until like Green Pal is in the lexicon of the English language, like Uber is in terms of like, you know, somebody might say, how are you going to get to the, to the party? Well, I'm going to Uber there. Um, you know, until Green Pal is like, okay, the grass is four feet tall. I'll just get a Green Pal. Like until people just say that, we're not done. Uh, so we have a long way to go. Uh, we're still at like day one of this thing. Um, and, and, it's, and it's actually starting to become fun because now we have, we have momentum behind us, whereas the first five years was, was excruciating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, now you have the foundation built. Now it's just, it's mass market appeal, right? Where I mean, right. you're saying it, you want it uh, like Uber or, or even brands like Band-Aid, right? It's, it's not necessarily the product itself versus the brand becoming right. synonymous to the language that's being used. Right. Uh, and so, that's where we go next. That's yeah. where we have to go next. Yeah. Wow. I love it. So let's shift a little bit back to uh, this idea of being a serial adventure. Um, so you, you already talked about it early on a little bit. Uh, now that you have this momentum, what have you done inside the business to free up or allow you to have time to, to now do more of these trips and adventure around the country and the world? Yeah. Yeah. So it's tough because I, I coach entrepreneurs and business owners in Nashville for free, just, just for fun. And, and so I, I, like, I, I, I get people that ask me all the time, like, wow, oh, I just want to live your lifestyle. And I, and I, and I, I want to be able to have the freedom that you have. And I, that's why I want to start a business. And I'm like, okay, that's awesome. Um, but you need to know, like, it's going to be like five years, uh, in the, in, in the trenches before you can get to a point where you can step away. And, and so that's, that's what I constantly have to like, like the little asterisk I put, I put by like the, the lifestyle I live now. I mean, now I travel half of the year. I, 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 like, I, I try to see five or 10 countries a year. This year's a little different, but, but, uh, it wasn't always that way. In the early years, it was, it was very much six, seven days a week in the office. hundred hours. Yeah. Yeah. hundred hours. Like, but now we've got some momentum going where I'm able to, from a position of, of, uh, strength delegate a lot of the things that need to be done on a daily basis and not and not delegation through like oh go handle this it's delegation from like no i did this for two years i know how to i know how to write code i know how to do the front end i know how our front end framework goes therefore i know how to i know how to hire a good front end engineer um so like being able to delegate from a position of okay i've done these things for years 
and I know what our system is and I know what our processes are and that's how I'm going to put this person in our process. And so I've, I've built a really good team around me now to where I can, I can delegate a lot of the things that need to be done to where I can focus on like the high leverage activities, like the things that, uh, that, uh, Stephen Covey, uh, the author of seven habits of highly effective people, the things that he calls that are important, but not necessarily urgent. So it's things like strategy, planning, like product development, like all of these things that go into like long term success, building like that long term momentum and that long term defensibility. That's where I live now. I, I no longer have to focus on the things that are uh, urgent uh, and not important. And, and so it's taken me years to get to that point. Now, now that I'm there, I'm able to like work from anywhere in the world. Uh, my team is all digital, all remote. Uh, and so I can check in with my team on a daily basis anywhere with an internet connection, which, which is insanely almost everywhere now. And, uh, and so now travel is like part of like my little flywheel. Like it reinforces why I do what I do. I, I have a real passion for seeing new countries, new cultures, uh, new interesting places I've never been. Uh, and it, it really almost reinforces for me a passion for business. Because it's like, okay, business is the engine behind this thing that you love to do. And so I just, man, like the last two or three years of my life have completely changed because I've, I've discovered travel and I've discovered uh, adventure as, as kind of the essence of life. Now, all that to say, like, you really, if you just are getting started and like you're working on a side hustle right now and you really want to get it to a million dollars a year in revenue, you kind of have to put those things on pause for, for a few years until you get your little flywheel going until you get some momentum going because it's, I don't think it's possible to do both at once. Yeah. At least, at least sustainable, right. To actually build up the business and, and to travel that much. Um, where, where I, I think, I, I, I think it's also being realistic around, um, how, maybe how large you want to grow your business. I know a lot of business owners who, you know, there may be a team of one or a team of few, with ambitions, but not ambitions to say have um, a multi-million dollar business that requires uh, maybe a lot more from them initially or long term, you know. So it's like, hey, I, I'm good with just you know with this space. Um, and, Absolutely, yeah. And so it's it's even coming down to like, what type of business, how large a business uh, do I want to build uh, as well? Definitely does, and and. Um... To your point, my first company, 150 and 150 people. Like I told you, if I went if I went away for a week or two, I'd come back and it would not be there. It required well, well, me. Like, just quick question on that too. So it required you. Is it because there were a lack of systems, say that you put in place yep. with GreenPal, uh, yep. allow you lack to step of, away? Yeah. Yep, lack of systems. Uh, it was it was something different on a daily basis every day. It was just more hand to hand combat. Um, asset intense trucks physically moving everywhere. Uh, things would go wrong. The, the chief would need to be there to handle these problems. Now, uh, you know, fast forwarding into my second business, it's it's harder in in one sense because it's hard to distribute a digital product, um, and and also there is no playbook for what we do. But in another sense, it's easier because there is a technological solution to almost every single problem you face. So if something goes wrong, uh, in the book uh, uh, Lean Startup, uh, Eric Reese talks about asking, asking why five times. So it's a fun little heuristic. It doesn't matter what business you're in. If you have a problem, you can ask why five times to get to the essence of that problem. So, for, like, for example, in our, in our business, uh, this homeowner is upset because they, nobody showed up to mow their yard. Well, why didn't anybody show up to mow their yard? Well, uh, the vendor got busy and he and he didn't uh, he didn't have time to fit it in his schedule. Well, why did he get busy and why did he place other clients over this client? Well, it's because he only has uh, two two other Green Pal customers, so he doesn't really care about this this person because they're on Green Pal. Well, well, why does he not care? Well, it's because uh, as it turns out, we're only driving him leads that are uh, 20 miles away from him. Okay, well, 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 why are we driving him leads there 20 miles away from him? Well, because we're not doing any marketing in the town that he lives in. Okay, so the problem is actually a marketing problem, and it's not an operational problem. It's that we need to drive more uh, marketing in the town he lives in because, as it turns out, he only has like a little five-mile service radius. So, 
like that's just one example into like the window of asking why five times to get to the essence of problems that you're dealing with. And so there is a technological solution for almost every problem you face in a tech business. And so that in a way that makes it a little easier to where you can develop systems on top of systems on top of systems to where you can then, you know, do the things that you want to do and not be like wrangling people every day. Oh yeah. The the power in that is is incredible. And 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 to me, I'm a huge believer in, and I'm massively in this process right now, right? I, I'm sure many of us are. You know, if we truly want that freedom based business that allows us to travel, uh, especially building, you know, our business to a certain level, uh, systems are a vehicle by which we can actually step away from things. Absolutely. You know, and that's obviously people as well, but but systems are built, tools are plugged in, people are plugged into those systems and it allows that autonomy to happen. And to me, the the Bible for this mindset is the four hour work week. And a lot of people um, may have skimmed through that book and didn't really get the essence of that book. And, and the title really almost has nothing to do with the actual essence of the book. He's not talking about only working four hours a week. What he is talking about in the book is building these systems and, and delegating with authority and, and, and delegating the right way and, and building something around you that doesn't require you to work 20 hours a day. And, and uh, the title is misleading. And, and I think a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs take away from it like, oh, I don't have to like, kill myself in the first few years. No, you're going you're gonna to work really hard if you're going to be successful. Uh, but this is kind of a framework for how to – uh, create leverage around yourself and how to delegate and how to build systems around yourself. I love that book. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I feel like that, that came, that book came early on to really the growth of what we yeah. see in the last five to 10 years. And it's only right. going to pick up, especially now with how business is shifting to more Absolutely. virtual and it's going to cause us, uh, more, I, I believe to step into solutions like green pal, um, or to build solutions like green pal, that support the the lifestyle and the economy that we're in now. And and I think right. there's incredible opportunity in a future with uh with businesses like this, whether we are the consumers of it or the producers of it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think at a macro level we're like in minute one of day one of oh, a yeah. lot of tr traditional stuff porting online. And if you can position yourself to to help be like part of the infrastructure around that. Um, it may take you 10 years to build something successful, but at least you have the wind at your back. Yeah. Well, that's a powerful message to leave off on. Uh, are, are there, say, uh, there's one other question I have uh, before we do wrap up, Brian. Um, if you could give uh, the entrepreneurs uh, and aspiring visionaries listening um, one action item to implement into their business um, based on what you've learned uh, what would that be as far as a next right step with where they're at? Yeah, you know, I guess I'll, I'll, uh, I'll focus that on somebody who's just getting started. And this is this is something that I come across quite a bit with with people that that are, I guess, you're like our dreamers and they're kind of between like dream phase and actual having a business phase. And the one thing I would like one little piece of advice that I could give that almost applies to everybody is do things that don't scale. So mm -hmm. do the things like that are hard to do, that seem tedious, that seem pointless. Um, uh, but like you have to like do them to then understand how you're going to scale them. And so for us, like a, a, an example would be passing out door hangers in their early days. It didn't scale, but damn it, it got us our first 200 people to use the platform to where we could like meet with them in every coffee shop around Nashville, Tennessee to talk to them, to then understand, okay, this is what we need to be focusing on. This is what we're doing right. This is what we're doing wrong. So like doing those things that don't scale in the early days to me is table stakes to like going from zero to one to like manufacturing that early momentum. And it's something that I think a lot of uh, budding entrepreneurs like gloss over and they want to just like fast forward to like the sexy part of like just sitting at the helm and watching like the trains run on time. And the, the fact of the matter is you can't skip that part. Uh, you have to like grind out the first six months, year, two years, three years, however long it takes to then understand, okay, this is how I build processes around these things I'm doing and make them scale. That's powerful. And, you know, and, and I, and I'm glad that you, uh, pointed that out. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of us do want to avoid that hustle phase, that hard work phase, but 
it often is essential, especially if we are the ones building the thing, right? Building the right. business. Well, hey, Brian, this has been incredible. Uh, where can people learn more about uh, what you're building? Obviously, your platform. Yeah, so anybody that's listening to this that doesn't want to spend their weekends cutting their yard, they can just download GreenPal in the App Store or the Play Store or go to yourgreenpal.com uh, and they can get somebody hooked up to mow their yard in less than a minute. Uh, anybody that wants to reach me, you can just email me, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, at yourgreenpal.com. If you email me and you have a business question, try to put me on second or third base with what you're working on and what your specific issue is, and I can try to help you. Love it. Well, and you're saying you're giving out uh, basically free consulting uh, in your area, <laughs> so hopefully demand doesn't increase. I mean, or hopefully, right? I mean, you are a successful yeah. businessman, so you can definitely, um, you know, I be love, charging. I love it. Anybody that's hustling, uh, here, here's what happens. Anybody that's, that's, that's hustling and trying to build a business, and I, if I can help them in some way, um, it makes me feel good. And it also it surrounds me with winners. And so when I'm surrounded by winners, then, I'm, then, then it helps me win. So it's, it's, I get more out of it than they do, actually. Yeah. Well, hey, this is incredible. I appreciate your time, Brian. Hey, I had a great time. Thanks for having me on.